In this lecture, I want to talk a little bit about solid and liquid mixtures. In particular, we're going to first address hydrated salts and then colligative properties, which are what happens when you dissolve solids into your liquids. So let's say sugar is the solid I'm thinking about, and I'm going to dissolve it in a liquid, so maybe a little coffee is what you're interested in. So I'm going to put as much in there until no more will dissolve, and maybe one or two crystals remain, but not a whole bunch. Just right at the point where it's a saturated solid liquid system. Okay? We've talked about saturated in terms of vapor liquid mixtures. This is a different form of saturation. It's how much one fluid phase will hold while the other one is still present. So I've, the liquid is now holding as much as it possibly can. Now I know from experience that if I change the temperature, the amount that can be dissolved will change. Okay? We've probably had experience that, you know, if you heat up some water or some tea or some coffee and you add sugar to it, you can add more than you can if it's cold. So changing the temperature is going to change the amount that will dissolve, which we're going to describe as the solubility of the solid in that liquid. Now there's data in Perry's handbook is probably the best place, but that will tell you how much of a solid can be dissolved in a liquid at a particular temperature. So for instance here I just, arsenic oxide, you don't want to drink this one. Okay, if you wanted to dissolve that in 100 grams of water at 10 degrees C, I could only do 62 grams, but I can get nearly 72 grams at 40 degrees C. So you can see that the temperature change is making an appreciable difference in how much I can dissolve in. Now, one of my favorite applications is supersaturation. So what happens is we dissolve a lot of sugar in a liquid, okay? So maybe you're trying to make rock candy like I've shown in the picture down below. When I make rock candy, I boil liquid or boil water and I dump a lot of sugar in there until it is just a syrupy, syrupy mess, but the sugar is all dissolved and really it's just right at the point where it's saturated. And then I cool it down. Well, it still is a liquid. It's still that syrupy liquid. At that stage, it is a super saturated liquid. If I waited for it to reach equilibrium, it wouldn't hold as much sugar as it has in there at that moment. So we have to give rock candy some time before it will actually form. One of the ways that we can get it to happen faster is to uh, throw a crystal in there to kind of get it all kick-started. Okay? So I can add a crystal of sugar and it will make the whole thing start to crystallize a little quicker. Or I can just in some way perturb the system so that I can start getting it to go towards equilibrium. So metastable solutions such as this are ones where if I wait long enough I cannot get that composition. And in this particular case the metastable solution is a super saturated one in that it is holding more than would be allowed eventually. And we take advantage of that because as those crystals finally decide to become solid, they crystallize together and we get some delicious rock candy out of it. Now the next category of things I want to talk about is the hydrated salts. Some salts, so NaCl is table salt, it is one salt, but chemical salts, um, when they bond with water molecules, they end up being a salt that has water attached to it, okay? And they form these little molecular uh, superstructures. It's like an apartment complex, I guess. Okay, so lots of little chemicals are all living together, and they're all attached to each other. So in this case, 
what we are doing is we're forming what's called a hydrated salt. Okay? When we have the salt that's formed without the water, it's just called anhydrous, meaning without water. So here's one. Magnesium sulfate is an interesting one simply because it forms lots of different possible sulfates, lots of different structures. It can have 0, 1, 6, 7, or 12 water molecules bonded to the magnesium sulfate molecule. Now, when we're doing material balances, we end up needing to treat these all as if they were one single molecule. So when you see these, oh, like if you're doing a H balance and it had this MgSO4 uh, 7 H2O, then the number of hydrogens in this molecule is 14. The number of um, oxygens in this molecule is 4 over here plus 7 over here, so 11. So just take this into account whenever you're doing material balances. And finally, I'd like to address colligative properties. You've been taking advantage of colligative properties for years. Uh, maybe you just didn't really realize that you were doing it. So when a liquid has a solid dissolved into it, those molecules affect a lot of the properties of the liquid. And in particular, these are the ones that we are most interested in, vapor pressure, boiling point, and freezing point. There are some applications where osmotic pressure is also interesting, but at this point I'm not going to emphasize that one. All of these depend on the molar concentration of the solute in the solution. It doesn't matter what the solute is. So what's happening is I've thrown a few, let's say, salt crystals in there, and they are surrounded by water molecules. And those water molecules are not ignoring them, so they're not going to be an ideal mixture. They're kind of protectively forming a little circle around this thing. And that changes the properties of the liquid because the liquid is no longer behaving in the same way. So let's look at these three that are most important for our purposes. And I went the wrong way. Okay, vapor pressure. Now what's going to happen on vapor pressure is it's going to effectively lower it. So if I know the solvent vapor pressure and I have a particular solute in there, the effective vapor pressure is going to be the original pressure less the mole fraction of the solute. Okay, the solute is the solid, the salt or whatever I was dissolving in the solvent times the original solvent vapor pressure. Now this is going to be any true um, for pretty much any mixture that's not volatile, so some, not something that wants to very easily vaporize, uh, not reactive. If you've got a reaction going on, that's a whole different game. And non-dissociative, so when the molecules break apart uh, when they are in the presence of, say, water, that somewhat changes the nature of this equation. These are also all cases where Ralph's law would be appropriate. Freezing point depression is a uh, one that we uh, use frequently. Uh, the solvent in the solution at a given pressure freezes at a lower temperature than the pure solvent at the same pressure. So again, if you have a small uh, fraction of the solute, the solid, okay, for ideal situations we can approximate it as it changes the melting temperature by negative R melting temperature squared, okay, divided by heat of fusion times the mole fraction. Now those need to be in degrees Kelvin when you're working with this. Um, but the interesting thing about this is this is part of what's happening when we salt icy roads and sidewalks. Now this equation isn't perfect for using with, well, like I say, table salt. Um, because it is going to dissociate, but it is a effective starting point. Boiling point elevation is another one. Um, 
boiling point will actually increase if you add a solvent or a solute to your mixture. So it's essentially the same equation as you had before, but with a plus sign. The boiling point is going to be increased by this addition of the solute. Melting point was decreased. Again, you use it in the same sort of way as you would have the other one. A lot of times people credit this with why you should add salt to water when you're going to boil it. Uh, most people are only adding a pinch or two of salt, so really you're not going to see much boiling point elevation. I, uh, the, when you calculate it, it's like 0.01 degree or something. So it's not an effective way of raising the boiling point temperature. Um, you, yeah, you would have to add a lot of salt in order to actually see that measurable difference. So let's look at some numbers. So I've got one milliliter of an ACL and one liter of water. I mean, that would make the water taste pretty salty, correct? So what we want to do is calculate these changes. So, okay, first of all, I needed some data. So the data I found, I found the specific gravities and molecular weights of the NaCl in the water. I found the melting temperatures and the boiling temperatures, the heat of fusion and heat of vaporization of these. And all of this data came out of your appendix. You might want to pause the video and take a look and make sure you can find those. Then I began doing calculations. Okay, first I needed to figure out what the uh, what x is equal to, and in this particular case, it, the mole fraction is 0 0.000666, which is why the effect of adding that pinch of salt to your boiling water is not an effective way of raising the boiling point temperature, as we'll see. If you want to look for the change in the boiling pressure or in the vapor pressure, um, the if I'm doing this at one atmosphere, which is the vapor pressure, then I end up with the change in the vapor pressure is 0.9993 atmospheres with this small amount of salt. The boiling point, 100.02 degrees. And finally, the freezing point, it lowers it by 0.07. So again, not a large change, but these can be important, and obviously, if the problem was that x was too small, you increase the quantities and you can change the effect. All right, so thank you. This concludes our lesson in uh, Introduction to Liquids and Solid Mixtures.